Good afternoon, friends. David Wright here, and I'm your host of the Disruptive Innovators Champions of Digital Business podcast. And really excited for today's episode. I'm joined by Jared Ansack from Sanford Health. Jared, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me, David. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely. Jared, for those of our guests who may not know, can you tell everyone a little bit about your current role? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm the Chief Digital Officer with Sanford Health. For a little bit of background on the organization, Sanford is the largest rural health system in the United States. We're headquartered in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and have a geographic footprint that stand, extends approximately 250,000 square miles across parts of South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa. So just for contextual reference, that's about the size of Texas across the upper rural Midwest. So very large distributed geography. And about two thirds of the patients that we serve live in rural communities. Vast majority of counties in our footprint are federally designated provider shortage areas. So it definitely presents some you know, unique challenges and opportunities for us. I've been with the organization now for just over a year and a half. At the time, it was a, a new role for the organization. I was, I was sort of the inaugural chief digital officer. And in this role, I have the you know privilege of helping to establish the vision and leading the enterprise digital strategy for all of our digital transformation efforts for both our consumers and our workforce. And I also have the, the honor to lead our, our enterprise data and analytics team, which includes you know our data science team responsible for predictive analytics and artificial intelligence development, et cetera. Getting to the stage where I'm looking at, you know, how can we leverage predictive analytics to better, you know, serve population health management? You know, that's the kind of stuff that gets me really excited. So yeah, looking forward to hearing more about what you guys are up to. As we start the episode, Jared, we always just like to ask maybe one piece of actionable advice you'd look to leave the listeners with today. You know, that, that, that's a really great question. I would say, you know, the one key takeaway would be to relentlessly focus on people. You know, it's easy to get distracted with the strategies and the tactics and the financials and the the analytics, the market dynamics. In healthcare, we look at physician recruitment, payer relationships, and all kinds of other really important data points. But at the end of the day, you know, it's all about the people that we serve. No business can survive without customers and no customers use a business that doesn't meet their needs. So, you know, if our true north is really about understanding people that we serve and meeting their needs, their expectations, their preferences in the best possible way, all of those other really important factors complement and really add to our success. But without people, none of the other stuff really matters for longer. Yeah, how do we construct strategies surrounding the voice of the patient? And what you got me thinking about surrounding people too is the people, the customers within the organization, they're ultimately what make the wheels turn. So how am I fostering those relationships? And yeah, great way to kick things off. So Jared, let's talk a little bit about where you started out. Um, you, so you've been with, with Sanford for a year and a half, but where did you start out and how did you get to be the, the CDO that you are today? Great question. I've been in the healthcare industry for for well over a decade. You know, I, I started my career actually with the health system. Going back a little ways, I actually originally planned to become a physician. I studied pre-med. I took the MCAT exam. I interviewed with a couple of different medical schools. In the meantime, in the interim between graduating with my bachelor's degree and starting med school, I took a what was going to be a temporary job at a health system that was in the process of implementing an electronic medical record for the first time in, in the organization's history. So they were in that process of transitioning a lot of paper workflows into digital workflows. And, you know, my job was work to work at the elbow with these physicians, these providers, as they tried to adopt this new tool that was incredibly disruptive to their lives and to their workflow and to everything that they they held dear. You know, within that frustration, you know, I saw an opportunity to really make an impact and a, a very different impact than maybe what I had anticipated. You know, I, I firmly believe that technology should help reinforce that patient provider relationship rather than obstruct it, right? That sacred moment between patient and provider that really made me want to become a doctor in the first place, I saw was really being threatened by some of the technology of the day. And I saw, you know, an opportunity to do something really meaningful and impactful, which ultimately led to me making a pivot. I ended up declining a med school offer, ended up going down the MBA route instead, and I've been in the healthcare technology space ever since. And so I've worked with a number of different provider organizations, uh, health systems, I've worked on the payer side. I've focused on provider and clinician experience. I've focused on the consumer, patient, member experience. But at the end of the day, it really comes back to the recognition, again, of the potential to really transform that patient provider experience that really gets me going every day. Jared, what would you say was one of the most important things that you learned along that journey, personally, 
and or professionally? And what was life like before learning it and after learning it? You know, that that's a really great question. I As I reflect back on my career, you know, there are a couple of singular moments where I feel like I was exposed to something that kind of fundamentally changed how I maybe thought about things or perceived the world. One of those that comes to mind is, you know, the first time I read The Innovator's Dilemma, you know, a book by Clayton Christensen. And, you know, it was one of those very few examples where it fundamentally changed the way I, I viewed the world. You know, it was kind of like, you know, the matrix with the red pill versus the blue pill. And it was like, that was my red pill moment where, you know, there was my career before I understood jobs theory. And then there was my career afterwards. And, and the concept with jobs theory that, you know, that book really articulates is, you know, that people have jobs to be done in their lives that they want to make progress on, right? And they hire products or services to do those jobs. And what really stuck with me was the idea that people don't really care about your solution. They care about their problem. And a customer might want a quarter inch hole. And so they hire a drill with a quarter inch bit to do the job but they're not necessarily looking for a drill. They're looking for how to create that hole. And, you know, after I understood that principle, you know, I stopped looking for drills and I started seeing holes everywhere. And it just kind of changed my worldview a little bit. And I started, you know, really beginning with defining the problem rather than jumping to solutions. And this is really challenging for people to do, right? Human beings are just naturally wired to be solutions oriented. You know, leaders tell their employees, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. We hire and train people to be problem solvers. So they're inherently conditioned and incentivized to formulate solutions. But the problem with that right is when we start with the solution we then go back we go out and chase a bunch of bells and whistles and try to bring it back and say okay now what problem can this solve and it's a little bit backwards and the best way to control it costs and to establish your product market fit and to ensure the usability and engagement of a particular product or service and you know to secure that elusive return on investment is to really start with the problem and avoid that shiny object syndrome that was one of those sort of pivotal moments for me i was trying to look up exactly when it was but steve jobs gave a talk about customer experience and because as developers or or creators right Right? We, we create a product or service, kind of like you're saying, and then we try to sell it to the consumer, right? As opposed to starting with the consumer and really constructing everything backwards from there. Great insight. What about a time, Jared, that, because I mean, you mentioned that perspective shift. And for me, the most profound perspective shifts that I've had in my life have actually came from times where I got my ass kicked or, you know, I, I was really down and out. But then I remember I had a, this life moment where things were really bad. And I, I had a, a meeting with this client that I had put on a pedestal for years and the meeting went great, but it didn't mean anything because I wasn't taking care of some of the personal things in my life and it just shifted everything and it, it was just it was really profound without getting into anything too personal but is there is there a time that you were challenged or or that you had a a moment that you failed on a project or anything like that but you ultimately took a a really profound lesson or, or anything like that away from it if we don't I think Kind of seize those opportunities to kind of learn from failures then we're bound to repeat them right and throughout my career i've had a couple of opportunities to to join a couple of different organizations. You know, one of those early opportunities, I remember coming into the new organization with sort of the mindset that I was going to come in and just shake things up and I was going to disrupt things and I was going to make an impact, right? And I was going to hit that sort of 90-day goal of really establishing some momentum and, and really kicking the tires. And it was a total face plant because I didn't take the time to really understand and appreciate the organization. I didn't take the time to going back to that kid's song, stop, look and listen, right? And just really sort of understand my audience, really know the organization, know the internal and the external dynamics, understand where things were at from a market standpoint, and just really appreciating the culture and starting by establishing some credibility, right? So don't be a bull in a glassware shop. You know, those first impressions are only given once. And that was a big lesson learned because it took a long time to reestablish, I think, some trust and credibility. And it has kind of informed how, you know, I've stepped into similar opportunities since then. And it's been a night and day difference, right? By just being patient and by, you know, being deliberate and intentional about really understanding you know, who I'm working with and who I'm participating with and collaborating with and establishing those relationships of trust. Damn, that is profound. Spending the time, especially when you're you're dealing with these large health system environments to to go around and make people feel heard 
and you know like you said understand the market i mean it's 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 dynamic i think that establishing credibility just like you said i mean that's uh awesome stuff so i want to talk jared more about your your current role i know you mentioned uh innovators dilemma which is awesome but at this point we just like to ask is there are there any other books or literary pieces that you're either reading now or, or that you might recommend to to our listeners there was a time in my life when I loved being able to sit down with a book and have peace and quiet and uninterrupted time, just really processing things. And Innovator's Dilemma was probably at one of those points in my career where I had that luxury. And fortunately, I should say, I'm in a position now, I have six kids, uh, two sets of twins. And so my life is full of noise and full of chaos all the time. And so if I had to pick a book right now, there's actually one that I read recently with my kids. And I'm going to pick a kid's book because that's kind of the thing that's taken a lot of my time and attention, right? And there's a book called The Remember Balloons. And, you know, this one in particular kind of struck me for, I'll be a little bit vulnerable for a moment. My mother passed away from Alzheimer's disease. And this book is based on this idea of, you know, this grandpa who's losing his memory gradually over time. And each of those memories is like a balloon, right? And eventually all the balloons are gone. And it really kind of struck home for me, right? Because I watched my mother go through this very thing. But at the end of the book, the child looks back and all of those balloons are now stuck to the child because that grandpa told all those stories and shared all those memories. And now they became, you know, passed on to the next generation. And so that struck home for me in, in a very vulnerable way. <laughs> it's uh, it's crazy. There, There's a, a few children. I, I just... I appreciate you sharing that, Jared. And my my uh, my grandfather. I was actually just talking about this with Joe Muscola because because he shared from Northwell. He shared something at uh, at Dreamforce to this extent. But my grandfather also had dementia. He he was living with us and brilliant guy, World War II veteran, police chief. And to watch that happen and you know like the moments of him like screaming when we were like helping him get in the car. It was, uh, it was really tough. So yeah, I just, I appreciate you, you being vulnerable with that. And, um, in regard to the children's books, it, I, there's a few books that I've read with my oldest daughter that at the end, I get a little, a little choked up. I mean, some of them are, are pretty, uh, pretty good. And one, one that I reference comically when I'm, when I'm working on accounts, especially when there's, you know, maybe a certain stakeholder we don't want doing something or, or things of that nature is don't let the pigeon drive the bus, which is another Another, uh, great children's book for anyone who hasn't read it. <laughs> But I, I digress. Yeah. Chief Digital Officer at Sanford Health. Jared, talk to us a little bit about your vision for IT and digital and kind of as it's derived from the overall mission of the organization. Yeah. You know, I, I shared a little bit about the, the sort of context of Sanford Health and kind of where we sit and some of the dynamics that, that we have as, you know, kind of that rural health footprint, you know, but I, I would say at Sanford Health, we really aspire to be the premier rural health system in the U.S., right? Not just the largest, but also the premier. That really emphasizes focus on our, you know, our employees, our patients, and our communities. You know, fewer than 10% of the physicians in the U.S. practice in rural communities. And so, you know, there's a huge challenge, but I think, you know, challenges also present opportunities. And so as I, as I look at the organization from a, a digital and a technology standpoint, you know, my future vision and my hope is that our organization can really unlock the value of digital and data to create transformative experiences for our patients that not only meets, but really exceeds their expectations, while also empowering our clinicians to operate at the top of their license by fundamentally automating away all of the mundane, non-value added administrative tasks that, you know, most providers are unfortunately burdened with. And, you know, I think one of the things that's, that's unique about Sanford, you know, we often think about innovation happening in Silicon Valley, you know, with some of these big tech companies and or in these big urban centers. And there's the perception that, you know, rural America is really kind of living in the past and will slowly and eventually benefit from some of those innovations over time. I actually see the exact opposite. So I see, I think being close to our rural communities is really a strategic advantage, not a disadvantage, where we can really understand our consumers, we can really understand our communities and the people that we serve, and we can partner with local organizations to develop you know, really novel and innovative solutions to real problems and opportunities that we identify. So you know, I'm really optimistic about the future. I, there's a lot of you know, doom and gloom when we talk about rural America and healthcare in rural America and hospitals you know, not being able to survive or sustain themselves. But I truly believe rural America is uniquely positioned to lead the way, uh, not just 
just follow, but lead the way in consumer focused digital healthcare experiences that, you know, meet the needs and preferences of all of those that we serve, you know, no matter where they live, what their zip code might be or, you know, the challenges that they face. That makes total sense to me. It seems to be a more intimate relationship and then looking to create a more personalized, compassionate experience in everything that we do when we're looking at, you know, digital and healthcare, starting with that kind of relationship, I mean, does definitely seem like an advantage. What are some of the key initiatives you guys are working on, Jared? You know, Stanford, probably like a lot of other healthcare organizations over the past, you know, year or so, you know, has been challenged with a lot of the, the dynamics with inflation, with workforce, with, you know, a lot of the sort of common issues and, and themes and trends that are happening across the board. I would say one of the things that we're really hyper focused on is being very intentional and deliberate about where we're applying the right tool for the right job, right? Not just doing digital for the sake of digital or technology for the sake of technology, but really kind of focusing again on solving the right problems, starting with the problem first and then picking the right solutions for those problems. So a couple of areas that we're really focused on currently, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, workforce, something that every health system I think is, is challenged with, not just in our industry, but I think other industries as well. You know, I think it's, it's significant to note that almost every other industry technology has led to increased productivity with the one exception of healthcare. So in healthcare, we've actually seen the opposite. We've added a bunch of technology over the years, but we've actually seen decreased productivity. So McKinsey did a study a, a few years ago that showed that, you know, healthcare delivery accounted for something like 9% of economic growth, but 29% of net new jobs. So in other words, as, as the demand increased, we just hired more people rather than made our people, our workforce more productive. And so I really see an opportunity there from a digital transformation standpoint. We've done a lot of what I would call digitization in healthcare. Digitization is that easy button approach of just finding a new tool and cramming an existing process or workflow into it and hoping that that's going to create efficiency. And the result is what we what we just articulated, right? We end up creating less productivity and more cost as a result. We're really focusing on you know digital transformation, which is really that holistic approach to thinking about people, process, and technology, and how do we fundamentally transform our operating models in a meaningful way. One recent, I guess, current initiative that we have going on at Sanford is, you know, one of our workforce pain points is patient access. So these are the folks that sit at the front desk in our clinics. They schedule appointments for patients. They answer the phone. They check people in. They register them when they arrive for their appointments. They collect co-payments, all of that stuff. We just don't have enough people anymore to do business as usual, like we always have. And we can't fill enough roles. We've had over 160 open requisitions for over a year and a half now. And so we fundamentally, it's a forcing function to make us take a step back and think about how do we do things differently? So we launched a new digital patient registration experience that allows patients to self-serve from the comfort and convenience of their own home with their own device, their registration experience, so that when they walk into the clinic, they're all set and they're ready to go. They don't even need to talk to the, the person at the front desk, potentially, if they engage the right way. And what we've seen by making it easy frictionless, consumer oriented, we went from about 6.7% engagement with our legacy solution to about 51.7% with our new solution. And 96% of our patients are saying they like it. They love it. They give it a thumbs up. It's generated over $2 million in additional you know, payment revenues that weren't being collected. It's reduced our no-show rate by 16%. And we've saved you know, full-time employee equivalent hours in terms of negating the need for having a person at the front desk entering all of that manual information. So great example of just how we can leverage technology in a really meaningful way to solve a, a real problem. Yeah, no, that's, those are some, some awesome KPIs and a great example of that. I mean, we, we kind of touched on some of the biggest challenges, I mean, facing healthcare. Any other challenges that you're facing right now at Sanford and, and trying to achieve these, these objectives? You know, I think one that every chief digital officer out there would probably say is a challenge is trying to justify, in some cases, a return on investment before making an investment. And that's really hard to do, especially when you're talking about something like creating a good digital experience. Because in many instances, there is a an ROI or there is an attribution in terms of value behind that, in terms of patient acquisition or patient retention or market share, or again, in this case with digital registration, patients self-serving something that we're having staff do without that solution in place. But in many instances, it's really hard to draw a direct attribution model and say, because we did this, we're getting this much revenue or this much cost reduction, because usually that's it's multi-factored. And so that becomes really, really difficult. So in, in some cases, we still need to measure the effectiveness and the results and the outcomes that we're producing 
But we also have to be willing and have the appetite to say creating a great experience is just the right thing to do. And taking a, a little bit of that leap of faith, at least in the outset, before you start getting some of those sort of quantitative values coming back. No, nah, that's that's been my experience too, uh, 100%. Especially when we're talking, I mean, workforce optimization and, and kind of the shortages you, you guys are facing, that's like a national issue. And workforce optimization, STEM attrition, new programs for quality quality assurance and, and just optimizing the productivity of the folks that are already there can create an incredible ROI when it comes to the FTE equivalent. But then it's not like you're going to lay those people off in most cases, right? Like you want to redirect those efforts towards scaling or towards other activities that can benefit the health system. So it's not necessarily, you're, you're not necessarily seeing that operating expense drop by that amount. And it is hard to measure in some cases. It's like you said, it's multifaceted, but I like that, you know, and, and it really is. And fundamentally too, I mean, one way to think about it, at least from my perspective is, you know, I don't know if it's as relevant for rural healthcare, but if health systems aren't making these strides as we speak, they will slowly get overtaken by Amazon, CVS, Walmart, these new retail players, I think are they're going to gobble up market share by way of this digital experience that they're creating. So it, it kind of presses the issue for health systems to dedicate the time and attention towards creating this experience. So, you know, it's great that you guys are already doing it. Chair, what about a, a couple, couple last questions for you? One would be any innovative technologies that, you know, are on the roadmap that you're very excited about or anything like that, that you might share with the listeners today? AI and chat GPT and large language models and conversational AI, generative AI, you know, those are all kind of the big buzz. Nobody was really talking about that to the extent they are a year ago. And it's really fascinating to me to see how much kind of focus and attention and excitement, you know, some of these technologies have really generated. And I think more impactful is I think just the sort of societal recognition and sort of shift that's happened over the last year in terms of willingness to embrace or to leverage, you know, some of these technologies. And so we're definitely, we've been developing AI, we've been developing predictive analytics for quite some time now. And again, I wouldn't want to ever do AI for the sake of doing AI, just like I wouldn't want to do digital or technology for the sake of digital. But when applied in a very intentional and deliberate way, it can be an incredibly powerful tool to, again, help to, you know, upskill our workforce, to augment our workforce, to make sense out of the wealth of data that our clinicians are overwhelmed with and to kind of find those key moments or those key data points that are most important for people to pay attention to. And so I think that there's just a, a huge, you know, untapped potential there. One of the things that's a little bit unique to Sanford, we actually have a, a single instance of our electronic medical record dating back almost 20 years. And so when you think about, you know, that, especially in the upper rural Midwest, we have a relatively static population too. Not a whole lot of people move in and move out in, in some of our communities. And so that longitudinal data set where we now have a 20 year horizon of individuals and populations progressive is just a treasure trove in terms of, you know, being an untapped asset. And so we're really excited and beginning to leverage that asset for what it is in terms of being able to develop risk scores that are based off of machine learning so that we can predict different disease states. And we have more than a dozen different clinical disease states now that we have been able to identify that have an incredibly high level of precision because they're based on our population. And so we can intervene sooner and we can you know, potentially help provide the right level of care for the folks that need it most. Yeah, I saw a really cool uh, sepsis algorithm. And I mean, like I said before, that, that's the kind of stuff that gets me really excited. So Jared, a couple last questions. First would be, where do you see, no, with, acknowledging that you don't have a, a crystal ball, where do you see the healthcare industry going in the future? And or what do you think will be some of the biggest changes as time passes? You know, I think healthcare is going to be one of the most, if not the most transformed industries by AI and automation in the next 20 years. That's my prediction. That's my crystal ball. And the only reason I say that is because of the current trajectory that we're on that is just absolutely unsustainable. Healthcare costs continue to increase exponentially and the, the results and the outcomes from a quality and a care standpoint don't necessarily match up to the costs that we're expending in this country for healthcare delivery. So I really do think technology 
the technology today is now available to really radically transform care delivery. And so I think that there's going to be huge advancements over the next 20 years in that space. But that being said, you know, when it comes to sort of a digital crystal ball, I kind of resist the urge just a little bit to kind of anticipate what's going to happen five 10 years from now, right? In many instances, a lot of a lot of people want to see like, what's your five-year roadmap or your three-year roadmap? And I, I kind of resist the temptation to propose those things because the landscape is evolving so rapidly, right? New technologies emerge, consumer or patient preferences and expectations change, caregiver workflows evolve, macroeconomic conditions exert pressure in different places, right? So instead, how do we really embrace and promote a culture that allows us to be more nimble, responsive, agile and flexible so that we can quickly act on those things that will bring value into people's lives, right? I think that's a huge opportunity for us, but I think there's at the same time, there's sources of inspiration all around us. If I were to ask you, what's a great digital experience? You know, most people will say Amazon for making a purchase or Shopify or Uber for transportation or my Delta app or Netflix for entertainment. Very few people would ever say their healthcare systems digital app is one of the best digital experiences they've ever interacted with, right? And so as I think about that, I just see the huge opportunity. How do we make finding care as easy as making a purchase on Amazon? How do we make preparing for care as simple and intuitive as booking a ride on Uber. So there's inspiration all around us just in terms of what the art of the possible could be for healthcare too. Really good stuff, Jason. And it's funny you you mentioned this the strategy on, you know, the roadmap that the the landscape evolving so quickly that if you set a plan today for five years from now, you'd likely be selling yourself short. And that's true for that became true for me in regard to how I live my life today, actually, because I in the past, I would you know have this vision and I would will it and and really and when I when it wasn't being realized, it would irk me so many things out of my control that when I left that perspective and, and started being in the present and just taking the next right action and just focusing on the here and now and what I can control and letting the rest go, you know, that's when things really took off. So it's just uh, it's, it's a similar principle. It's just cool how that aligned. Very cool. So Jared, this has been amazing. Final question we always just like to end with is if you could go back 5, 10, 15 years in time, what advice would you give your younger self? That's a really great question. You know, I think if I go back five, 10 years or earlier in my career, even, I remember just being so impressed with people who had this really detailed proposal that they had done all of this background and research on and added all of this complexity to. And I thought that that was something that was admirable and something that I, I initially in my career tried to model a lot of my efforts after. And I think looking back now, my advice to my younger self would be to do the opposite, actually focus on simplification. And especially as it pertains to digital, right? Great digital experiences makes complex things simple. And healthcare can be very complex, right? But it's always easier to add complexity than to remove it once it's taken root. It's better to start simple and add complexity than to start complex and try to simplify. And, you know, a lot of times in digital transformation, we talk about all the cool stuff that we're doing and the new shiny objects that we're implementing. But a big part of success with digital transformation is, you know, really what we're not doing, right? And one of my favorite quotes from Steve Jobs was when he said, you know, you mentioned Steve Jobs earlier, so I'm going to go back to that. He said, I'm actually as proud of the things that we haven't done as the things that we have done. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things. And I've taken that to heart and really said, you know, what should we be focusing on? We can't do it all. We can't boil the ocean. How do we make sure that we're removing complexity where it doesn't make sense and really focusing on a great experience overall? Sage-like advice. Drop the mic. Jared, such a pleasure to have you on today. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. We will catch you all next week.